you're going to record it at your end, right? I'm recording. All right. So here we are, everybody. Welcome. And uh, I have a, a wonderful surprise for you today. I have the acclaimed documentary filmmaker, Ken Burns, with us tonight. That's right, Ken Burns. He's going to be co-hosting the Benny Goodman segment. He's an authority on it. And uh, you may not be able to see him on your screen. Um, that's because he's at a socially safe distance away from me. And uh, he's just over my right shoulder at the back of the sofa. And I can see he's waving at you. Can you, can you see him waving? Well, uh, I can't see him also. You can see him too? That's great. Hey, what, what's that, Ken? I can't because the glasses what, what, so Ken, what are you, dark, what are you, I can't Ken, 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 what do you want to say? You want to say hello? Wait, hold on, Ken, Ken, Ken. Listen to me for a second, Ken. You've got to follow protocol like everybody else here. I have to put you on mute. Okay, that's fine. When, you're, when you come on, I will unmute you. That's right. No, that's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Um, no, everything's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, you've got time. Sure, sure. Um, you've got time. Sure. Just through the doors here, down the hall. You can't miss it. That's right. We'll see you back soon. Whew. Well, you know, when you got to go, you got to go. Even celebrities got to go when they got to go. I think uh, Ken is probably a bit nervous tonight, you know, this being his first night with you. Anyways, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, Ken is co-hosting with me tonight. And uh, uh, he's, in fact, he's carrying a very big load tonight on, on the Benny Goodman story. I uh, remember th this is my seventh session. And up till now, I've been doing a lot of heavy lifting. And after this session, if you'll have me back, I have some more heavy lifting. So I really do need to pace myself. And Ken is an unbelievable help for me tonight. And I'm sure you're going to be in great hands with Ken. So um, enjoy. Sit back. Uh, you know, one thing that's really cool, I get to direct the great director himself. I'm going to be telling Ken when and what material to present. So that's pretty cool. Only one thing I'm going to ask my audience tonight, before Ken leaves, you have to remind me to thank him. He is so modest that sometimes I forget he's even here. He's kind of like uh, a virtual invisible man. So you'll, I'll need your help there. Anyways, tonight we're going to do Benny Goodman. And that's going to last about an hour, an hour and five minutes. If we can stretch it another 15, 20 minutes, I would love to complete Charlie Christensen and uh, Lionel Hampton so we can finish the jazz era. And then we'll be ready to start the rock and roll era. So that'll, that'll be a lot of fun. Okay, as we always start, we, we begin with our bedrock themes. The first theme is really about why does less than 2% of the American population, as Ben Sivern says, uh, influence more than 80% of American popular music. And one of the reasons I propose is uh, this driving force, this longing for acceptance. We've seen that in previous episodes. Uh, today, the second theme is going to be very prominent. That's Jewish Americans identity and relationship with black Americans. Uh, it's be going to be very relevant and it's a pretty complex uh, theme as you'll see it develops, evolves. And so it'll be interesting as I hope you will find as well. And the third theme is the structure of the music. It's the underlying sadness in the music. And uh, I'm going to hit you with that theme, not till we get to the last segment when we do Lionel Hampton. I have a little surprise for you there as well. So here we're going to start Benny Goodman. And, uh, you know, I didn't do that by accident. I have Elvis Presley up there for a reason, uh, because the jazz era, the swing era is very similar to the 
uh, oncoming rock and roll era in the 50s. You'll see a lot of similarities when we get to that stage. He's also known as the King of Swing. We'll find out if that's uh, an apt title or not. So he started off, let's look at his origins. He was the ninth of 12 children born to poor Jewish Russian immigrants. At 13, Goodman was already a member of the Musicians Union at 13. At 14, he was able to improvise in vaudeville acts and played with older college kids. So obviously this kid was a prodigy. He quit school in his freshman year in high school to become a professional. And uh, just in time, Ken, you're back, great. Uh, yeah, take a seat, no. I, I'm, you don't have to explain to me what took you so long. Uh, no, 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 too much detail. Just have a seat and let's, let's roll this forward. Thank you, Ken. We're gonna look at the beginnings, the early years of, of Benny. Chicago, 1910. The streets are inexpressibly dirty. The number of schools, inadequate. Sanitary legislation, unenforced. The street lighting, bad. The paving, miserable and altogether lacking in the alleys and smaller streets. And the stables foul beyond description. Hundreds of houses are unconnected with the street sewer. The older and richer inhabitants seem anxious to move away as rapidly as possible. Jane Adams. In 1902, a Jewish refugee from Poland named David Goodman, fleeing Russian persecution, had moved his family to the crowded west side of Chicago. It was there, on May 30th, 1909, that his wife, Dora, gave birth to their ninth child, Benjamin. The family lived packed together, sometimes in unheated basement apartments, forced to move again and again when there was too little money to pay the rent. There were days, Benny Goodman remembered, when there wasn't anything to eat. I don't mean much to eat, I mean anything. The situation was just impossible. The father was working shoveling lard in the meat yards in, in Chicago, and he would come home stinking with the smell of this, uh, the, the lard that, and the animal uh, refuse that he had been dealing with. And Benny said he never forgot that. He remembered that uh, all his life, that, that smell. David Goodman was determined that his children would do better in America than he had done. And when he heard that a neighbor's boys were earning extra family income by playing in a dance band, he saw a way for his sons to begin their climb. What Benny did go to a Hebrew school, as is the custom of all good Jewish boys, they go to Cheder and they learn how to be a bar mitzvah boy. And in going to the Hebrew school, they had instruments there. And Benny went with his two brothers and he was the smallest of the trio of Goodman boys. So he got the littlest instrument, the clarinet, because it was very light. <laughs> His brother Harry, who was a big, softic guy, he got the bass. So that's how Benny was introduced to music. Somehow, David Goodman managed to come up with 50 cents a week to buy his 10-year-old boy lessons from a classically trained German clarinetist. From the beginning, Benny was unusually talented and unusually serious about his craft. He practiced every day religiously all his life. He was clearly better than everybody else. He was one of these guys who was utterly confident, even when he was 12 years old. He, he was never shy about standing up and playing. He could walk out on a stage anywhere, even as a little boy, and he was great. He was completely confident in what he could do. I guess he treated the music like a kid might who loved baseball. He loved his baseball bat. His horn was everything to him, and anything he could make come out of it was exquisite, and he was constantly a perfectionist. He was listening to jazz in Chicago then. There was a lot of jazz. Louis Armstrong was there. There were a lot of wonderful musicians. And I guess Benny always adored and respected the way the black man handled his music. 
because all through Benny's life, he went up to Harlem when he was in New York or in Chicago, he'd go to the dance halls and he treated his horn and his music like a lover would a gorgeous woman. Goodman listened to all the great black clarinetists in town, Johnny Dodds, Jimmy Noon, Buster Bailey. By the age of 14, Goodman was playing with pickup bands made up of musicians far older than he, and he was making $15 a night, three times as much as his father could earn working 12 hours a day in the stockyards. He dropped out of school to pursue music full time. In August of 1925, he was playing at the Midway Gardens, an outdoor pavilion on the south side designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, when he got an offer to go to California to join a dance band led by the singer Ben Pollock. But Goodman was still only 16 and had to talk his parents into letting him make the long journey west. Benny Goodman was now earning enough to feed the entire family. So they bought a newsstand for the father so he could be outside. It was better work. It was, you know, easier. And uh, in fact, they even said to him, Dad, you know, you don't have to work anymore. But he said, no, he said, I'm a man, I'm going to work. On the evening of December 9th, 1926, on his way home from work, David Goodman was struck by an automobile. He died without ever having seen his son play in a professional band. He had been waiting, he told his son, till he could afford a decent suit so that he would not be too conspicuous among the well-dressed dancers. For the rest of his life, Benny Goodman could not mention his father without having his eyes fill with tears. But the tragedy, combined with the hardship and crowding of his youth, would inspire in him a relentless drive to better himself. In just 10 years, Benny Goodman would become the most popular musician in America. Thank you, Ken. You again, note the attraction to black American music, our theme number two. And uh, I don't know if you picked up this line. If it hadn't been for the clarinet, I might easily have been a gangster. It's kind of a similar line that Artie Shaw used when he described his childhood and he found music instead of a shotgun or, or, uh, or, or some gangster uh, mode. So the other Benny that uh, they referred to in that little clip, uh, Goodman starred with the Ben Pollock Orchestra and the band uh, was playing one night in Atlantic City when Arnold Rothstein was shot. Now, you may recall from our second session, Arnold was one of the Jewish gangsters that we highlighted. He, uh, he, was, the or he was a great organizer of crime. He, he schooled everybody, uh, all the mafia uh, schools, uh, all the mafia crimes uh, were schooled by him. And uh, he's probably best known for fixing or as allegedly fixing the World Series in the 1900s, early 1900s. Anyways, he's, he's in Atlantic City when the, when the Pollock Orchestra are there playing and he is shot and he staggers down the, the elegant Park Central Hotel stairs and he dies beneath the balcony in which Benny and the Pollock Orchestra are playing. And you remember Rothstein was uh, similarly shot in uh, the Boardwalk Empire if you watch that series. So it parallels that story. Pollock is the son of, himself of a Jewish immigrant and was called the father of swing. Now that could be because he played swing at an early, uh, early stages of that music uh, genre. Uh, he was also, uh, you could say he was the father to uh, Benny Goodman. He mentored him, he got him going and he's known as the King of Swing. Uh, but really, probably the most important reason is Ben Pollock 
to his credit, invented the swing or the backbeat, almost by accident, which propelled all big bands to commercial success. He almost, he came upon it by accident, as I said. He used to be a drummer, and uh, drumming typically involved a lot of fancy stick work, you know, fast and fancy. And one night at a club, Pollock remembers, quote, a master of ceremonies complained that all the fancy stuff was throwing off one of the variety acts. So I just played rhythm. And the guys were so amazed with the easy way they could swing. They wanted more drumming like it. So I discovered the secret of solid drumming, that is, to feed rather than overshadow, to send the other guys rather than play a million beats. And that is the backbeat, you can't lose it. Became known as the Chicago Beat, four equally demar demarcated steady beats to a bar, and it was embraced by all musicians, black and white. Now, what probably helped was the discovery of the symbols. And you may ask who discovered the symbols? It's another backbeat invention that made, was made possible by another Jewish uh, musician. It was a Jewish Chicago drummer. His name was Victor Burton, born as Victor Cohn, another Jewish musician who changed his name. And he invented a rod with two symbols facing each other and connected them with a spring and a device. And using a foot pedal, he could whack them together providing a rhythmic balance to the heavy first and third beats marked by bass drum. So bum, chica, bum, chica. So that was the, that also helped the backbeat explosion. And what a deal, Franklin Roosevelt is inaugurated as president in 1933. And along with launching the New Deal, he wanted to lift the spirits up. So forgive the, the, the pun there. Um, and he wanted to do that by removing the prohibition. This was supposedly a dry period, but as you know, there were thousands of speakeasies that were uh, thriving during the prohibition. They weren't legal. And now, because the prohibition is lifted, these speakeasies became very challenged. It was during the Depression, don't forget, people now had access to liquor, and they would, could stay home and save money and drink at home. So the speakeasies were, were suffering. And uh, also the, the liquor, just like regulated pot today when it first came out, the booze at first was rotten. So some people wished for the prohibition to come back and get better booze. And the jazz artists who got gigs at these speakeasies were now out of work. Along comes Billy Rose, entrepreneur. He quotes, let's open an exciting new club with nude female dancers and midgets and a waterfall and a room to accommodate a thousand people. Just one thing we need, a white dance band. And along comes the ambition, ambitious opportunist, Benny Goodman. He's all of 23 years of age now. He's been a professional for eight years. He's still playing with, the Benny, with uh, Ben Pollock. And while part of the Ben Pollock band, he's showing some, some pretty big ambition. Uh, he was accused of taking too many solos on stage. And he even booked the Ben Pollock band to perform, except he did that without Ben Pollock. So Ben Pollock obviously was not pleased and he fired Benny Goodman. And so Goodman found work at a good studio, as he's a good studio, as a good studio musician, and he hated the music he was playing. He was feeding radio uh, music to fill advertisements and sell products like soap and cars, but he wasn't really happy. And another opportunity came along and uh, he did want something more. You, you know that he was at this time attending all the clubs in Harlem, absorbing all the new and innovative music performed there. And so when the opportunity did come up at Billy Rose's club, Goodman swooped in. So, uh, Ken, if we could roll again, please. Goodman really was driven, and he's an example of a musician who he wanted to be the best. He wanted to have the best band. He, he wanted to do whatever it was going to take to learn how to play and be on a very high level. Inspired by Chick Webb and Fletcher Henderson, 
Goodman began to round up young white musicians who shared his passion for what he called genuine jazz, including trumpet player Bunny Berrigan, a hard-driving drummer from Chicago named Gene Krupa, and a young singer, Helen Ward. It was her attractive presence that finally persuaded Billy Rose to hire Benny Goodman's band for his new nightclub. They had a lot of fun that summer. It was new, it was fresh. And the thing that happened was the last night of the Billy Rose engagement, a man came in from an advertising agency and heard Benny and invited him to audition for an extraordinary thing. Nobody had ever tried a three-hour radio show entirely made up of music. And when? On Saturday night. Boy, what a break, you know. In the autumn of 1934, the National Broadcasting Company planned a new Saturday night radio program called Let's Dance. They needed three bands, one to play rumbas, one to play sweet dance music, and one to play the new hot kind of swing music, the kind of music Benny Goodman wanted to play. The audition for the Let's Dance show was held in the agency. They piped the music into the offices, and they had all the young secretaries and office boys, the young people who were working in the agency, get up and dance. And they'd ask them which bands they liked best and which one they didn't. They ended up voting. And the Benny Goodman band won by one vote of these kids. So Benny got the job. But Goodman had a problem. He didn't have a big enough or good enough book, a set of arrangements to fill all the hours he was expected to play on the radio. He explained his problem to a friend, the singer Mildred Bailey. Mildred said to Benny, Benny, the band sounds just great. One problem, it sounds like everybody else. Just sounds like a good band. You've got to have a personal identity. And she said to him, out of the blue, she said, why don't you get a Harlem book? Well, John is standing there, John Hammond, and he's in on this conversation. He had the access, and he knew immediately what to do. He went and got Fletcher Henderson. Henderson's own band had fallen on hard times, and he was happy to sell his old arrangements, his book, to Goodman, and to write new ones for him as well. Then he was a Mandarin. Uh, he believed that the band should be perfect. He didn't have the best soloists. His solos weren't nearly as good as Fletcher Henderson's soloists, but the ensemble was spit and polish. So Henderson loved writing for Goodman because he could hear his arrangements played, you know, the way he imagined them. Goodman used other arrangers, white as well as black. But without Fletcher Henderson, Goodman said, he would have had a pretty good band, but something quite different from what it turned out to be. The type of arrangements that Benny Goodman would get from Fletcher Henderson, the classic one is King Porter Stone. You have the strong bottom rhythm. Um, you know, you have a... A white band leader was now broadcasting the kind of swing music that had first been played at the Savoy and Roseland ballrooms. Thank you, Ken. So Let's Dance was a success, and, uh, but let's not forget that qualified black musicians at the time were denied the opportunity to audition the part that Goodman won. During the Depression, Fletcher Henderson, as it came up in the clip, was forced to disband his uh, jazz orchestra, and uh, Goodman needed content to, to fill the radio hour over 13-week contract. He hired Henderson, 
and uh, Henderson sold his arrangements and, and wrote new arrangements for Goodman. That's key because what Goodman requested was that Henderson provide new arrangements with familiar tunes. Remember the Amer Irving Berlin songbook? He took music that was familiar to white audiences and then jazzed it up. And that was the hook. That's what brought the white, white audiences to listen and find hear this new exciting sound. And Goodman also hired Henderson's band members to teach his musicians to play swing. Okay, Ken, uh, I'm glad we're getting along so well here. Um, what do you mean you want me to call you Harvey? What's that all about? Uh, why are you pulling your ears? I'm starting to worry about you, Ken. Let's get the show on the road here. March 1935. Benny Goodman and his Let's Dance Band are a great medicine, a truly great outfit. Fine arrangers and musicians who are together all the time. They phrase together, they bite together, they swing together. Metronome. spring of 1935, things looked bright for Benny Goodman. The audience for the Let's Dance radio program was growing every week. But then, workers at the National Biscuit Company, the show's sponsor, went out on strike. Let's Dance was canceled. Desperate to keep his band together, Goodman scrambled to find work. Eventually, his agent arranged a cross-country tour to end in Los Angeles. Benny Goodman was not pleased. He knew that most of America still hadn't heard swing. And the West, he said, had a reputation for being corny. The band set out in mid-July anyway, playing one-nighters as they went. There was no money for a bus. So the musicians had to drive themselves across the continent. Things did not go well. In Denver, the manager of one dance hall demanded they leave after hearing them for just half an hour. I hired a dance man, he told Goodman. What's the matter? Can't you boys play any waltzes? In Grand Junction, Colorado, the band played behind chicken wire to keep from being hit by the whiskey bottles hurled by disappointed dancers. As Goodman's little caravan of cars continued west toward California, he realized that if their luck didn't change, it was unlikely he could hold his band together much longer. On August 21st, 1935, Goodman and his orchestra finally reached Los Angeles. I thought we'd finish the engagement, he said, then take the train back to New York, and that would be it. I'd just be a clarinetist again. Then the band pulled up in front of the brand new Palomar Ballroom. They found this enormous throng of people lined up around the block waiting to get in. And they thought, well, wait a minute, what's this? We can't be for us. Benny now has been told by every ballroom owner across the country not to play the jazz stuff. They just want to hear the dance tunes. So he gets to the Palomar and there's a crowd there, but he's not taking any chances. Mm -hmm. 
waltzes. So they start playing the waltzes and the, the pop, the stock arrangements. And the audience is just kind of milling around. There's no response. And so they were doing this, and it wasn't going very well. And uh, Bunny Berrigan or somebody in the band said, uh, you know, the heck with this. If we're going to go down, let's go down doing the kind of music we want to play. So they broke out the King Porter stomp. for it. They've been listening to this stuff on the radio and that's what they wanted to hear is jazz music. The audience was cheering, crowding around the bandstand and shouting and jumping. And they couldn't believe it. They're absolutely stunned. And the next morning Benny Goodman was famous. Armstrong, and had been nurtured in the dance halls of Harlem, was now echoing across the country. The swing era was about to begin. Thank you. Down and out, but they made it at the end. It became America's music. Swing with all its roughness, which was played by Louis Armstrong, Fletcher Henderson, and Duke Ellington for three years now, mostly and only to black audiences. Goodman declared the king of swing by white audiences, made it America's music. It was the depression People needed a release, and he unleashed the pent-up excitement and physicality that no one was prepared for. So I want you to note the adaptation of Blue Sky, Irving Berlin's Blue Sky, jazzed up in this little clip here. All right, take it away, Ken. just as fast as we can because we are anxious to get the unemployed from relief rolls onto payrolls. We are not only building roads, we are building bridges, we are building dams. It is going into public buildings and various other projects. Song is the wind chime of memory. And 
these were our songs. They were part of the daily ordinary. And this, I think, is what took Benny over the gap, out of jazz into the American parlor. He arrived with blue skies. Well, we knew blue skies. I mean, everybody knew Irving Berlin. So there we were, home free. This is our guy. Within a month of Benny Goodman's unexpected success at the Palomar, his records stood at number three, number two, and number one in California record stores. He was 26 years old and already being billed as the king of swing. Suddenly, his music was everywhere, and Goodman, the reticent son of Jewish immigrants from the slums of Chicago, was becoming a matinee idol. I kind of was in love with Benny Goodman. I don't know why. I thought he looked great, and I loved the way he just stood there and he didn't over, you know, emphasize himself. He was cool. To me, he was a cool guy in my youth. You know, I was 16 years old, 17. The king of swing. Yes, sir, it's Benny Goodman himself. And I used to put the radio on at high volume and put my ear to it to hear Gene Krupa. And my mother would go crazy, saying, what are you doing? I said, Mom, shh, got to hear this. On March 3rd, 1937, Benny Goodman's orchestra began a two-week engagement at the Paramount Theater in Times Square. Until then, they had played hotels and ballrooms where alcohol was served, and the customers were mostly adults. But at the Paramount, everyone was welcome. For the first time, high school students who had been buying up Benny Goodman's records now had a chance to see their hero in person. The moment had come and they were pouring out of the subways around Times Square in mobs. And the police didn't know what was going on. Where were all these kids coming from? What was it all about? Music has such an incredible beat that it just brought you out of yourself and you got out of your seat and you danced with whoever stranger you didn't know. But it was just fun to get up and move with that beat. And the kids started jitterbugging in the aisles, right up around the stage and some of them even jumping up on the stage. And that was what triggered a great deal of publicity. And Benny Goodman then, although he had been successful, now he had become really an icon, a great, a great hero of popular culture. He looks like a gentleman. And then he, in the middle of a clarinet solo, all of a sudden he's got one foot raised and he's hopping around and he sits down on a chair and he practically falls over it and he becomes completely consumed in the music. And this is mesmerizing for an audience because it's not a show, it's not a put on. It's Goodman. Benny that was so great was that it was kind of an explosion. He showed up on the scene completely unknown as far as we were concerned. 
we knew Ellington, we knew all the other big names. And here's this kid nobody had ever heard of. And overnight, this guy walks into the American parlor with jazz by the scruff of its neck. And all of a sudden, jazz, which was almost a cult music, has become American popular music. And that's what Goodman did. stuff there, Ken. Okay, so it became a craze. And you know, uh, the last time we met, we talked about Artie Shaw and how we, how we left the stage in 42, just suddenly stopped performing, went to Mexico, hideaway. One of the things he hated about the music industry was this adulation uh, and people fawning all over him. So he just, he was fed up with it and left. So there's amazing parallels with the beginning of the rock and roll age in the 50s and the swing era. And that's what I'm gonna cover in this slide here. Jazz and rock and roll, maybe you didn't realize this, were both code words for sex. Both emulated sex with their energetic dance. Both transitioned from a primarily black audience to a white audience, made safe by using white performers. Both swept the country, creating a craze. And both faced off rebellious youth against non-accepting elders, the so-called generation gap. Adulation, we saw that with Goodman, and certainly we know about it with Presley. Both created a surge in record sales, primarily a youth market. So we got Ken Burns again to talk about this craze. And this is a short uh, clip here. I hope you enjoy it, it's kind of funny. But Swing had its critics. The sweet band leader Blue Baron denounced it as nothing but orchestrated sex. A phallic symbol set to sound. And Dr. A. A. Brill, a noted psychiatrist, was even more concerned. Swing music represents a regression to the primitive tam tam tam, a rhythmic sound that pleases savages and children alike. It acts as a narcotic and makes them forget the reality. They forget the depression, the loss of their jobs. It is like taking a drug. My parents, anyway, didn't really understand anything about music. Why am I listening to Duke Ellington? Why am I listening to Louis Armstrong? They're out of it completely. They don't even know why I'm into it. I loved it. That's all I know, and that's all I cared about. There was that sense that we were rebels. We were doing something that our grown-ups didn't know about and probably didn't like very well. And the jitterbugging, of course, was very much a part of it, that, that dancing, because it was strenuous, and the girls are out there with their little short skirts and their bobby socks. As they twirled around, those skirts would rise up a little bit like that. Nothing like what we have today, mind you, but it was, you know, it was pretty nice uh, when you were a young guy. Ken, we're almost done. We got one more clip from you. All right, what was jazz doing in Europe during these formidable years, 1933-1945? Of course, uh, Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini banned what they called nigger Jew or jungle music. They thought it was destroying culture. They jailed anyone who was listening to it. And for those who loved it, it was an expression of freedom. Of course, Benny Goodman records were banned. Interestingly, Artie Shaw records were not banned in Nazi Germany because the German ministry thought Artie Shaw was Bernard Shaw's son. <laughs> okay, if you say that word again, I'll take this clarinet and bust you across your head with it. Double jeopardy. What Benny Goodman replied to a drunk who approached him at a club and asked Benny, 
what are you doing with these niggers in your band? Okay, this is it, Ken. This is your last segment. I want to thank you because I, I know you're going to leave right after this segment. And uh, uh, you, got, you were just terrific. Uh, I know you've got a fantastic career ahead of you. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Ken. One of Benny Goodman's best loved records had been Body and Soul, played by a trio he used only at recording dates. The whole country had heard the record, but it had never occurred to Goodman to bring the trio on stage because the piano player, Teddy Wilson, was a black man. Wilson was the reserved, urbane son of a librarian and a professor of English at Tuskegee Institute. His light touch and seemingly effortless technique perfectly matched Goodman's own playing. There was never been a piano player like Teddy Wilson. I think one of the things that distinguishes him from all the piano players who precede him, Waller, Duke Ellington, is they had a very percussive tack. Teddy Wilson had a light, lyrical tack. It's an exquisite sound. He makes every key sound like a chime or a bell. And he's very fast. No one has ever made the piano sound quite like that. After two measures, you know it can't be anybody else but Teddy Wilson. Goodman had first played with Wilson at a jam session in 1934. Teddy and I began to play, he remembered, as though we were thinking with the same brain. Within weeks, Goodman had brought his drummer, Gene Krupa, and Wilson into the studio to record together. But when a concert was scheduled in Chicago and the promoter, Helen Oakley, suggested Wilson be included on the program, Goodman was reluctant. I said, let me bring Teddy in. That'll be a tremendous attraction. Benny said, I'm not such a fool. I, I, I'm making a hit here, and I make, this is going to be my career. I don't want to wreck everything to present a black talent in the middle of everything. And so uh, I don't like the idea. This was the Depression, mind you. And the last thing he wanted to do was to jeopardize this and throw it all out the window by taking what seemed to everybody to be a great chance. Helen Oakley, who knew how profoundly Goodman had been influenced by black musicians, and who was eager to show that integration would work on the bandstand, finally convinced him to take the chance with Wilson. By that time, uh, black and white musicians were fraternizing and had been for a long time. They'd go into uh, midnight jam sessions together and sit until two, three in the morning. But what Goodman did, he put Teddy Wilson in showbiz. Goodman never forgot the trio's first appearance in public. The three of us worked together as if we had been born to play this way, he said. The Goodman thing was as solid as a family, Wilson said later. We were all there just like brothers. Benny Goodman now saw no reason why mere custom and prejudice should keep him from improving his band by enlisting more great musicians just because they were black. In a rundown bar in Los Angeles, he heard Lionel Hampton, 
a master of a new instrument, the vibraphone. Goodman hired him on the spot and transformed the trio into a quartet. They play every night and they make music you would not believe. Not a false note, one finishing his solo and dropping into background support, then the other, all adding inspiration until they get going too strong to quit. on the spot and it is a collective thing the most beautiful example of men working together to be seen in public today Otis Ferguson the New Republic despite the quartet's success few other white band leaders would dare follow Goodman's lead. The music may have been colorblind, but the country wasn't. We had a place where we would sit and where the musicians could stop and have a drink. And uh, uh, a guy came with a bed and said, well, Benny, what are you doing with those niggas in the band? And Benny said, if you say it again to me, I'm taking Clinton, but she will cross the with. Wow. Ken, you're still here. <laughs> Jeez, I thought you were going to go. Oh, you want to stay for one more clip. Uh, the challenge match, oh, of course. Thank you, Clint. It's like uh, his encore. Uh, you got to see this last clip. Uh, it's the challenge match. We'll find out if Benny Goodman really was the king of swing. Do you remember what it was like? Maybe you do. Maybe you were there. Maybe you were there in New York two-thirds of the way through the 1930s, when there were so many great bands playing. You could go to the Manhattan room of the Hotel Pennsylvania, where Benny Goodman was playing with his great band, complete with Gene Krupa. Maybe you'd rather go to some other hotel room, like the Palm Room of the Commodore, for Red Norbo and Mildred Bailey and their soft, subtle swing. Or to the Grill Room of the Lexington for Bob Crosby and his Dixieland Bobcats. And then there were the ballrooms, the Roseland with Woody Herman, and the Savoy with Chick Webb, George T. Simon, Metronome. The Savoy Ballroom at 140th Street and Lenox Avenue was still Harlem's hottest spot. And Chick Webb, who had been one of the first band leaders to play swing, was still in charge. Chick Webb is uh, a phenomenon. There's never been anyone like him, never will be again. He was a hunchback dwarf, suffered from a spinal uh, disfigurement in his childhood. Uh, an absolutely brilliant drummer. Here's this little guy sitting behind a full-size drum set, and yet they had to nail it down to the stage because the force of his foot pedal was, would, would have kicked the bass drum right off. Chick Webb was my first hero that I ever saw. And I walked in, my old man took me there. I was, must have been 12 years old, to the theater. And I'm looking for a real, like a drummer, and all I see is a gigantic bass drum with a head sticking over the top of it, and these two, two arms flailing around, playing the greatest stuff I've ever heard in my life. On 
On May 11, 1937, Benny Goodman ventured uptown to challenge Webb in what was billed as the music battle of the century. Fellas, this is my hour, Webb told his men. Anybody misses notes, don't come back to work. Four thousand fans jammed into the ballroom, and mounted policemen and firemen had to be called to control the crowd of five thousand more who couldn't get in and refused to go home. Among those who did get in were Norma Miller and Frankie Manning, professional Lindy Hoppers now, who had been taking on all comers in dance contests around the world. They had come home to the Savoy to see their hero face his most celebrated challenger. The night that Benny Goodman came to play against Chick Webb, this was an electrical night. This was, yes. I mean, the, the Harlem was here right. of being around the Savoy Ballroom. Here's Benny Goodman, the King of Swing, and here's Chick, Chick Webb, Webb, the King of Swing. The King of Swing. <laughs> you know, as far as we're concerned, you know, yeah. this Chick Webb going up against, against Benny Goodman. You know, Goodman was a giant because they called him the King of Swing at that time. And any band that, that played swing, we would buy that record. So we, we, knew, right. we knew about Benny Goodman. A lot of people may not realize that a lot of the arrangements that Benny Goodman had, Chick Webb had the same arrangements. When they get on the bandstand, now, this is when you can know which band is the best, by listening to them play the same arrangement. saying this because not because yeah because it's chick <laughs> webb or because i'm being prejudiced but to me <laughs> i feel that chick webb i'd swung benny goodman that night right you know because i i, I, I saw guys on benny goodman's band bandstand when chick webb was playing i seen guys on that they sat up there and said they just shook their yeah. heads the goodman band was routed Gene Krupa bowed down in tribute to the man who had beaten him. Chick Webb, he said, had cut me to ribbons. Nobody, one of Webb's men remembered, could have taken it away from Chick that night. All right, one more time. Thank you, Ken. It's been a pleasure having you. So Benny Goodman followed up one year later with the classic jazz concert at Carnegie Hall. Jazz was never played there before, and it was a huge success. Charlie Christensen, electric guitar, extended Goodman's success. He was a great guitar player, as you'll find out soon. Benny Goodman in retrospect, 10 years ahead of Jackie Robinson, Goodman helped integration. He was popular, popular enough that he did not have to tour the southern states where racial segregation was still enforced by the Jim Crow laws. He popularized jazz, although hot music was already played before him by Chick Webb, Duke Ellington, Fletcher Henderson, and Benny Carter, but he did bring it to the white audience and he did make it America's music. Per Ken Burns, Benny Goodman, was one of the first virtuosos in jazz, a master of his instrument, capable of elegant and melodic improvisation, even at breakneck speed. 
He was also a very difficult man, hard man to work with. He was very driven, as you saw. He was a perfectionist, and he wanted to surround himself with the best musicians possible. He was a somewhat reluctant pioneer at first. Politics and civil rights did not interest him, but willing to defy racial conventions, provided it would make his orchestra or band greater. So final words on Benny essentially played until he died. He lived 77 years. He did have a relationship with Lana Turner, and if you remember the last session, Turner was also later married to Artie Shaw. Goodman did marry Alice Hammond Duckworth. That's a big name. If you've heard of the Vanderbilt family, very, very high society, wealthy family. They were married from 42 to 78, and they remained married until her death. John Hammond was her brother and also a close friend of uh, Benny Goodman. Now, John Hammond, uh, I should say something about him because his name keeps popping up. Uh, he's the one that introduced uh, Lionel Ham ha Hampton and Charlie Christensen. He's the one that discovered Count Basie and signed him. He's the one that discovered uh, Billie Holiday and signed her. Later years, he brought, uh, he signed Bob Dylan. And uh, the people around Columbia were saying it's uh, one of Hammond's follies. Later on, he signed Leonard Cohen. So the guy was a pretty big name in the music industry, uh, very well respected. He belonged to the Vanderbilt family, but they disowned him when he chose music as his profession. And interestingly, that he was such a big name in music and he had such a great hall of musicians, he actually died penniless. Anyways, Benny Goodman had two girls with uh, Alice, uh, Rachel and Benji. And after the, just after the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War at its peak, he toured Russia to help thaw the ice, the Cold War. He was warmly received in Russia. And uh, remember, jazz was previously not even permitted in the Soviet Union. Okay, so that's the Benny Goodman story. I want to do a little sidebar. I want to bring uh, this. The next two segments are really short, so hang in there, please. Uh, this guy deserves more attention than I'm going to give him. It was John Hammond, again, who introduced Christensen to Goodman. And the initial meeting between Goodman and Christensen did not go well. Per Christensen, I guess neither one of us liked what I played. We didn't have a good afternoon. But Hammond was relentless. On August 16, 1939, without even consulting Goodman, he invited Christensen to a gig Goodman was playing the night after the two of them met. Goodman decided to put him on the spot. He invited him up to the stage to play Rose Room, a tune Goodman assumed Christensen would not know. And Rose Room was played for 40 minutes and Christensen stole the spotlight. Goodman hired him on the spot. Christensen was influenced by horn and not early guitar players. So his style was very different. It was, was described as horn-like. And Christensen's new sound paved the way for bebop as he is credited with influencing Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Melonius Monk, and Miles Davis. And his early electric song sound beyond rhythm guitar influenced the likes of T-Bone Walker, Eddie Cochran, B.B. King, Chuck Berry, Carlos Santana, and Jimi Hendrix. And as a result of his influence, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll of Fame in 1990 in the early influence category. And so Christensen contracted tuberculosis, tuberculosis in the late 30s. He had a heavy schedule in the early 1941. His lifestyle had him playing with Goodman's sextet and his orchestra. And following that, at late at night, he played jam sessions in Harlem. He was exhausted and he was ultimately admitted in June 1941 into Seaview, a sanatorium on Staten Island. After making progress, however, his health later declined. He died March 2nd, 1942 at the age of 25 didn't even make the 27 Club. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Bonham, Texas. A headstone was finally placed in Gates Hill Cemetery in 1994, only to find out in March 2013, the county recognized that the marker was in the wrong spot and that Christensen was still in fact buried under an unmarked concrete slab. 
Lionel Hampton. Okay, we're in the last, we're on the stretch here. April 20th, 1908, August 31, 2002. Jazz vibraphonist, pianist, percussionist, and band leader. And he worked with many. You can see Benny Goodman, Buddy Rich, all the big names, Teddy Wilson, Charlie Parker, Charles Mingus, Quincy Jones, Wes Montgomery, Dinah Washington, Dizzy Gillespie, Stan Getz, Art Tatum, Louis Armstrong, on and on. Guy was phenomenal. And he was signed by Norman Granz on Verb Records, who we're gonna talk about in another session. Background. Started music in the 1920s as a drummer and was known for his ability to twirl and juggle multiple pairs of drumsticks without missing a beat. During this period, he began practicing on the vibraphones, a new instrument. It's essentially a xylophone with metal bars and a sustained pedal as used in a modern piano, which when pressed vibrates, hence the name vibraphone, and it was invented just in 1920. Louis Armstrong invited him to play his vibraphone on two songs in concert in 1930, and that's how he began his professional career as a vibraphonist. In 1934, he was already leading his own orchestra. He performed with Bing Crosby and Louis Armstrong in the 36 film Pennies from Heaven, and he's wearing a mask in the scene while playing the drums. In November 36, Benny Goodman Orchestra came to LA to play the Palomar Ballroom, as you recall. John Hammond, our buddy, brought Goodman to see Hampton perform. Goodman invited Hampton to join his trio, forming a quartet along with Teddy Wilson and Gene Krupa, becoming one of the first racially integrated jazz groups to perform before audiences and were a leading group of the day. And uh, Teddy Wilson, of course, the jazz pianist, was also a Black American. So what did Hampton have to say about Benny? I understand what Benny was doing. Benny was integrating the musicians at the time. Black and white had never played together. This was integration, and it was a total success. And Benny protected it that way, you understand. I would say this was the front door to Jackie Robinson getting in Major League Baseball because at that time, no blacks were playing no place. They weren't playing in basketball, football, on the stage, of course, except as we know in the Gershwin and Kern musicals, they weren't making any appearances together in public with whites, but we were doing the North, South, East and West, and we were the rage. Hampton, along with Wilson, because of their talent, enthusiasm and respect for the music, opened the minds and hearts of those they performed for. On his own, he left Benny Goodman uh, Quartet under amicable terms, and he formed his own band in 1940. Huge success during the 40s and 50s. However, by 54, the big band movement was declining in popularity in the US. And in response, Hampton began touring in other parts of the world. He performed in 20 countries during his music career. Hampton in Israel. In the late 50s, Hampton was in tour in Europe when he and his band were invited by Yitzhak Ben Svi to perform in Israel. Ben Svi would ultimately become the second president of Israel. After receiving a staggering welcome, Hampton and his band played 48 concerts in four weeks at venues ranging from concert halls to army camps. As Hampton recalled in report in Downbeat magazine, in Beersheba, we played to an enthusiastic audience of 5,500 border guards near the Gaza Strip. They were mere teenagers, just boys and girls, but they showed their appreciation by beating time to the music on the butts of their Tommy guns. I'll never forget that day, and I don't think they will either. An everlasting love affair. During this tour, Hampton not only won new converts to the music he loved, but he developed a deep connection to Israel and Judaism. Over his lifetime, he raised significant sums of money for the state of Israel. On, of a particular importance was the time Hampton spent with Chief Rabbi Yitzchak Halevi Herzog in his own home. While Hampton hoped to have a little Bible discussion, instead, the Chief Rabbi more interested and insisted on a lively discourse on boogie-woogie music. Only after their enthusiastic discussion about music 
that the, te- that the chief rabbi Shohampton, a, a treasured ancient scroll of the Torah and a scale model of an ultra modern temple. The chief rabbi then presented him with a Bible inscribed with, to a friend of Israel, Mr. Lionel Hampton. May God watch over you and save you from illness for now and forever. The meeting inspired Hampton to write the King David Suite, and he dedicated the symphonic piece to the chief rabbi. Hampton also cites visiting the tomb of King David as a source of inspiration. Per Hampton, I remember I walked into the tomb and I walked around for a few minutes. I was thinking about David and his harp, and a chant just came to me. Others were also inspired by King David. You'll know this song, I'm sure. Like Hampton, Leonard Cohen was also inspired by King David and his harp. From the opening verse in Hallelujah. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. Note the reference to the Jewish move, move as Ben Sentry calls it. That's the minor fall, the major lift. We've, pro- we've referred to it many times. That's the Jewish move. And it's right in Leonard Cohen's song, Hallelujah. King David Suites was one of Hampton's few symphonic works that he created. He performed it with many symphonies around the world, including the Winnipeg Symphony, the Israeli Philharmonic, and the Boston Pops Orchestra with Arthur Fiedler. The Boston performance was televised by PBS in the early 70s. During the performance, Hampton and his jazz ensemble would sit in the middle of the orchestra so that the music would blend in. The concerts were very successful and exposed Hampton to new audiences. Hampton also played with the St. Petersburg Russian Symphonic Orchestra at the Munich Opera House. This is what they had to say after the concert. We played with a 75 or 80 piece orchestra and it sounded like it was coming from heaven. The audience must have clapped for 40 minutes and they brought us back for seven encores. It was quite a tribute to my very hard work. And to the best of my knowledge, there's never been a commercial recording of King David's Suite. And like me, you may wonder why. There is uh, on YouTube, uh, Hampton and the St. Petersburg Russian Symphonic Orchestra, King David's Suite. Naturally, it features a harp. We're not gonna play the whole thing. It's like 25 minutes long. I'm gonna play a cup. I'm gonna play about five minutes of it. I'm gonna start with the introduction, bring you in the harp and the vibraphone, and then we're gonna swing right to the back end. All right, so hang in there, we're almost done.
Don't you love that smile? Hampton performed steadily until 1991 when he suffered a stroke, collapsing on a Parisian stage. In January 1997, his apartment caught fire, destroying his awards, his keepsakes, and his belongings. After the fire gutted his home, the first thing he said, once he safely escaped the building, was, where is my King David suite? Sadly, he never recovered it. He performed at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History in 2001, shortly before his death. His funeral featured a performance by Wynton Marcellus, and his procession began at the Cotton Club in Harlem. The final injustice was that in 2008, in the big Universal Studio fires, Hampton was listed among the hundreds of artists, that also included Benny Goodman, whose materials were destroyed. 2008, Frank Como, who arranged Hampton's music for 20 years, recovered the original King David Suite manuscript, complete with Hampton handwritten notes. Because of Hampton's inspiration from the state of Israel and its religion and his admiration for the chief rabbi and prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, Frank Como decided it would be fitting that the suite be archived at the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Hampton, all his life, used music as a medium to cross racial and cultural boundaries with his message of inclusivity. Music should bring people together, not divide them, as some notorious artists do, without mentioning names. So Hampton, with there's two pictures. This is how we're going to end our presentation. Hampton with St. Petersburg Russian Symphonic uh, Orchestra. That's the first photo. And this is Frank Como holding the Lost Suite manuscript in the second photo. So thank you very much. We're back. Uh, I think you can unmute for a moment. See how many people we got left here. 88. 88. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello. 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 Thank you, Alan. Great job, Alan. All right, we finished the jazz era. We're about ready to start the rock and roll era, and uh, we're also going to do a music Broadway session. There's a lot, there's a lot of music Broadway. When is the next session, Alan? When, when's the next oh, that'll, That's up to the, the shul. We're going to have, have to coordinate that with the shul. That'll come after this meeting. I'm sure we'll have another session. I've got at least 10 or 15 in the can, so why not? Let's do it. Why are you sending it during this? What's that? Any, uh, let me see, should I, are there any ch uh, chat questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, listen, I kept you a little longer tonight. We stretched it so we can get through the jazz era. But I'm, we'll have fun next time, too, for sure. Oh, yeah. Hey, Sharon. Say thank you to Brian. Nice of you all to join me tonight. So, everybody, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. Alan. Hey, Alan. Albert. Hey. Albert. Hey. Jerry. Alan, hey. professional job. Thank you, big Al. Thank you, guys. I, Alan, I hope you enjoyed, job. Ken. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Hi, Tony. All right, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Great. Alan, you're marvelous. Thank you, everybody. Oh my God. I'm looking forward to the next one. So are we. So uh, we all are. Hi, Doreen. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Susan, Doreen. If you Doreen, I saw him there. Hi, Sharon. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good to see you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Hey, George and Leslie, how are you? I see you. Oh, all the way in New York. Finally see us. Regards Thank you, the, Alan. It was the, terrific. Thank it you was. for joining me. That was great. Gary, Where are you hiding, go, Bailey? Let's, let's have this real soon. Bailey's downstairs in the basement. <laughs> but Arlene didn't show her face yet. Where is Arlene? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Oh, she's fighting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right, till next time, everybody. Have Bye. a good evening. Really great. Yes. Thanks, okay. Jimmy. Thank I'll you. see you tomorrow. Be well. Take care. That was Bye. just Bye. great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a nice Bye. evening.
Thank you. Thanks it was for, great, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining thank me. You. Good night and thank you. Susan, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. No, no,